All right. Okay. So, how many people, when they hear Gazelle Finance, think we uh, finance safaris or zoos? Anybody think that we do that? We got Gazelle, right? How many people think we finance mashrutkas? When I first came to Armenia, I asked people, I said, what do you think of the name Gazelle? And everybody said mashrutka, you know. Ah, it's gaz, right? Um, so, you know, the, the honest truth is we don't find us mashrutkas, though if you have a good mashrutka business, we'll certainly um, look at it. Does anybody know, and this is for your top students who prepare for something like this, does anybody know what the actual technical definition of a gazelle is? It's actually a macroeconomic term. Anybody know what it means? Going once, going both. Oh, here we go. Uh, I'm not sure, but it might be um, small and medium-sized enterprises that grow 20% per year. Pretty good. Not bad. Give her an A plus. Yes, it is. Uh, it, we, we call that a compounded annual growth rate of 20% per year for four years. Mm -hmm. And in most economies, with the exception of the natural resource rich company, countries where they have the natural resource curse, um, these are 5 to 10% of the companies in a, in, a, in a given country, but they represent 50 to 80% of all new jobs. So job creations happen from high growth companies. And so if you were to think about your, your country's development, you need gazelles. Gazelles are critical, right? And you see this with the IT sector, right? I was just talking to Madeline over at, at Pixar, and she said they're now the 14th most downloaded app in the world, and that happened here, right, in Armenia. That's pretty cool, right? That was a gazelle at one point, and they've grown up, and I don't know what you would call them now, but they are still a high-growth company. Um, so gazelle finance... We're not in zoos, we're not in the Mershutka business. We are actually in the business of investing in small, medium enterprises that grow fast, okay? Um, so, interesting picture. Does anybody know who this individual is? John Doerr. Correct. Does anybody know who Cargill is? So, I, don't, I want to tell you a story about my experience in life, and, and uh, you know, as you get to my age, you get a little bit of wisdom, right? And this is the way I learned about private equity and venture capital, and, and how I understand it. it was from my interaction with these two organizations. So in uh, 2008, does anybody remember what happened in 2008? It was a bad year, all right, financial collapse. I happened to be in the market raising money for my second business in 2008. And it was three guys, you know, like three guys in a garage kind of thing. Three guys with a great idea. Um, we raised a bunch of money from a guy named Jim Wolfenson at the time, who was the head of the World Bank. And um, so we got, a, we got the business going. We got some clients, started to generate some revenues. And we wanted to go for our Series A, okay? And a <coughs> private equity term, that is after the seed financing round, your first formal institutional capital round. And we got opportunities to... Uh, get shortlisted by two investors. This individual right here, John Doerr, is perhaps one of the greatest living venture capitalists in the history of the world, because venture capital started in America. Cargill is the largest commodity trading company in the world. It's a private company in a state called Minnesota, kind of a northern agricultural state, big player. Them and another company called, um, oh God, it's a Brazilian company. It's, uh, will come to me, but they're the two largest players in the word, world uh, in terms of commodity trading. And this company that he represents is a famous venture capital company. These guys are a big corporate player, but like big corporations, they have their own venture capital and private equity arm. Um, and that at the time was called Black River Asset Management. And so we came to both companies and we pitched them. And you'll, in private equity, you're constantly raising money because ultimately you're managing other people's money. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And so you're constantly pitching people for more money, more money, more money, more money. And so we went and pitched this, these guys, and we went and pitched these guys. And the outcome was reasonably positive in both situations, but there were some differences. And we had a hard decision to make as three entrepreneurs. These guys, they weren't completely certain about the partnership. They liked the business idea. We had this sort of interesting clean tech, fintech thing, and they thought that was really cool. And I'm not going to go into the details of the business, happy to talk about it later. Cargill liked, liked the aspect because the fintech had an environmental commodities issue side to it, okay? So these guys, Cargill, which more, were more private equity players, and these guys were more venture capital players. This guy has invested in and led the rounds for Amazon. Heard of Amazon? Google. Google Twitter. 
Sun, acquired by Oracle. Um, basically, we're talking about two, three trillion dollars of market cap sitting in this guy's I, you know, brains and ideas. And at certain points, he was the decision maker for whether Sergey Brin got a job or didn't get a job or who got more money. This guy's a major player, right? And we sat in front of him and pitched, and he said basically, all right, guys, yes, but you guys have to move to Silicon Valley, and you see that room, there's a glass window, I want you sitting in there for the next six months, next to me, okay? Now we'll start to talk, about, talk about terms and structure, right? He said, you know, we'll take X percent, but it wasn't necessarily majority, but we, have, we want majority control, all right? And for the next three, six months, we'll see what happens. We might get rid of one of you guys, we might, you know, put a CFO in, we might drop somebody in, we might change it, we might move you to Brazil, I don't know, right? But we're in charge, but we like it, and we'll give you $3 million, okay? That was his offer, all right? That was my Series A preferred offering from this guy. This guy's, they said, you know, we're more private equity guys, a little bit more passive investors, we'll give you three years. We'll be on the board, minority shares, but if you don't achieve what you said you're going to achieve within three years, we're going to step in and we're going to use our liquidation preference to make some changes, which could mean, like this guy said, happening in the first six months, in the end of three years, we might fire one of you, we might do this, we might do this, we might sell you, we might use our drag-along right, two terms we'll talk about later in the, in the presentation. So I had a choice to make. Do I move to Silicon Valley for the next six months? I'm married. About to have children, have a house in Washington D.C., or take these guys' money, and still live in Washington D.C. and work for the next three years and see if I can hit what I said I would do. In the end, we, I couldn't give it to my wife to move to Silicon Valley. She's a professor in the United States, um, in a deep Washington D.C. area. So I chose Cargill. Okay, sort of the shortened version. All right. So in the end, we had a minority shareholder who was very uh, active on the board and the governance but not active in the operations. As you can see with this guy, he was gonna be very involved in my operations. Okay, that was the big difference I had to make when I took on that capital. We chose the latter. And long story short, we went for three years. We almost didn't get the money because 2008 happened and we were closing and we got the disbursement right when everything blew up, but we still got the disbursement. We did what we said we were going to do and we eventually sold the company, but not without some real scares. They actually did use LickPref they did say they were going to drag us, and that fear of the drag, to drag us into a sale, scared them out of us, and we were able to get what we had needed to get done, and we were able to sell the company, and, and everybody got made a little bit of money. Now, obviously, I didn't make a lot of money. I probably wouldn't be here. I'd be sitting on the beach somewhere in Hawaii, right? But we did pretty well, and it was a good experience. So, whenever you give a presentation, you always want people to come away with three ideas. And if you can just remember three things from this presentation, it is other people's money, I call it OPM, liquidity, and value-added capital. Okay? And these are three themes that you're going to hear throughout this presentation. And I want, at the end, when we have our discussion, we'll talk about terms, we'll talk about why, we'll talk about real-world examples, how each one of these is always playing into my decision-making and my team's decision-making all the time. Okay? So, the title of my presentation is Private Equity and Venture Capital, a Catalyst for Economic Growth in Armenia. Real grand title, okay, for private equity and venture capital. But what is private capital, what private equity, and what is venture capital, what does it mean in the context of Armenia? Because America and Armenia are very different, right? And the idea that you're just going to do private equity and venture capital like you do it in America or you do it in Hong Kong, probably not. Probably not. Very different markets. But a lot of the principles apply. The four key ingredients you need for any sort of capitalistic activity is that you need some type of regulatory framework. You need rules, right? And within those rules, you need some economic activity. The word you're going to hear over and over and over is liquidity. We like to see flows of capital coming in. We like to see flows coming out. And that could be within and out of businesses, in and out of countries, more liquidity, more capital flowing, stock markets, all those things that require people to buy, sell, and trade with each other. That grand sort of idea is liquidity. And you need to then match supply with demand, right? So private equity requires that you get private capital from somebody to come and let you do what you want to do in terms of investing, right? 
very fundamentally different than a bank, right? So everybody knows Ameria, everybody knows Aneco. How many people in this room, if they had the opportunity and they got a really good offer from Ameria, would take that job? Oh, come on. A really good job from Ameria? Well, maybe there's no addition to that. So how many, how many people, if they got a really good job with Pixar or one of the IT companies, Synopsys, would want to take that job? There's a, an IT person. So, you know, it's interesting because here in Armenia, the, some of your, the best employers for finance are the banks, right? There's not a lot of private equity and venture capital here, right? I would take an Echo and Ameria and the team there any day versus an American bank. Right, and the team there. Because the American banks right now are basically like an algorithm. There's no thinking going on. There's actually real thinking going on in American Echo. Right? And why is that? Because once you get to a certain stage of development, a lot of the capital, the sophisticated investing, occurs outside of the banking sector, in the private capital market. So when you go to a developed market, you go to Silicon Valley, it's all happening with private capital. And so the two types of capital are private equity and venture capital. So how, how would you define venture capital? And we're going to back to my example with John Doerr. Somebody want to give me sort of a one, a one sentence sort of uh, definition of venture capital? Take a risk, take a risk. <laughs> going once, going twice. All right, well venture capital is early stage. It's very early stage. It's when you start investing typically even pre-revenue, maybe a little bit of revenue, certainly not proof of concept. Sometimes it's R&D stage. Private equity tends to be later stage. And it's when the, the, the revenue model is working, maybe there's still some profitability issues, it's scaling. So they're definitely very, very much different. So the IT sector, that's where you're going to see in Armenia a lot of venture capital going on. In the real sector, you're going to see more private equity, typically in this market. Um, so if you need to match sophisticated investors, remember other people's money, the concept? You have to have entrepreneurs, right? That's the, the matchmaking that needs to go on. Entrepreneurs plus capital equals an investment opportunity, right? So the problem is organizing institutional capital, sophisticated capital, other people's money to come to this country is not easy, okay? Small country, not a lot of liquidity, right? And so to make private equity and venture capital work, you might need to take some different approaches. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Gazelle has done, because it's a little bit different than traditional private equity, but it has a lot of the elements of traditional private equity. And at the end, when we, we go through this, and I think there might be some questions, we're going to talk about sort of three key sort of technical elements of private equity and venture capital. Valuation, you need to be able to, when you make an investment, know what the company's worth, right? And I'm sure People are taking corporate finance or taking valuation course, discounted cash flow analysis. Is that something that people know and heard of, right? Comps analysis, which is basically trying to find a comparable company and say, if I get this money this much, right, it's going to be based on the same fundamental principles of another industry, right? So if I'm going to invest in the automotive industry, I might look at General Motors when I compare it to a value of the company that I'm looking at investing. Um, in fact, we've done it many times. We've invested in a number of restaurant chains, and we look at a number of different comps when we start looking at equity valuations that are global in Europe and similar, like Panera Bread, for example, is a, a very well-known model. And we've used that model to look at what we think the EBITDA margin should be in the future, okay? And lastly, before I leave this slide, the biggest difference between banks and private equity and venture capital is the amount of value added, remember value add, when you actually add services to your capital and the amount of interventions you do proactively. Banks are packet, passive, private equity is active and proactive. Okay, so who is Gazelle and what are we, right? So Gazelle is an impact investment fund. We've been operational for three years. We have a portfolio of I think we've made 23 investments, we've had four exits, um, and so I think right now we maybe have 17 to 19 companies right now in our portfolio. We work in Georgia and Armenia, um, and you know, you'll learn a lot about IRR, but we have a gross IRR, what we have on, on our valuation about in the low 20s. Our four exits have had a realized IRR of 26%, that's really good to have four exits um, in, a, in a private equity fund that's only been operational for three years. Again, it goes back to the point of liquidity. <coughs> if you've got to put money in, you need to be able to get the money out. Otherwise, it's just grant money, right? So you have to get out of your positions. 
And we do a lot of structure on front to get out of our positions. Um, and, and so when we looked at Gazelle and coming into these markets, what we noticed is a couple things. We saw a very small corporate market. How many corporations, what we would call greater than 15 million revenue type companies, do you think you have in, in Armenia? Give or take. Anybody want to give an estimate? Take a risk. 20 to 30? It's not bad, actually. How much? How many? Uh, How greater much? than 15 million in revenue. 15 million annually? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have around, I think, 80, 100 companies. 80 or 100? Minimum, at least. Minimum. Yes. So Mika thought it was, was 200. I sometimes, you know, very liberally say 500, but let's say it's 200. Let's just split the difference and say it's 250. 250 corporations is not enough to support a private equity business. Maybe venture capital in the IT sector, but it's not enough to support. There's not enough of addressable market. You guys have learned about the term addressable market. You can't do something, whether you're going to create your own business or you create your finance business, not knowing what the market potential is. We determined that the place to be in Armenia and Georgia was actually the SME market, all right? Because there's 15,000 of those guys, right? And we think there's about 1,000 gazelles out of that 15,000. And we need about 20 or 30 of them, right? So you think about that, pipe, that, that sort of funnel, 15,000, 1,000, 20, 30. Okay? We need to talk to a lot of companies to get to our end target, right? We got to find the best entrepreneurs. That is what we are getting paid to do is to find the best entrepreneurs. The problem is that little companies are unsophisticated. And so what we did is we developed a very, very specific model. And it's all based on self-liquidating instruments. We use quasi-equity instruments. Quasi? Anybody know what the word quasi means? Quasi means it's not A or B, it's somewhere in between. We make equity look like debt, we make debt look like equity. All right? So we take an equity position, but we don't say to our investors or to anybody, oh, we're going to sell this company on the New York Stock Exchange. Because that probability of that happening is very low. Maybe in the IT sector, but that's not our business. We're not in venture capital. So what do we do? We structure it with instruments that require the owners, the company, and the individuals to buy back our shares at a pre-agreed price, okay? Now, if we do find a buyer, great, we all benefit, it's a wonderful day. In Georgia, we've done this four times. One has been an acquisition, three have been management buyouts and refinancing by banks, okay? So that's kind of the unique feature. We'll talk a little bit about how we structure the instruments when we do the Q&A. Um, and the other thing I think it's really important, it goes back to the other people's money, is that we have really serious institutional capital, all right? We have the U.S. Treasury's money and the Dutch Treasury's money, right? So literally, when we make an investment, we're investing the U.S. taxpayer's money. And in fact, my loan, I actually have a loan and I have equity, I have a loan directly from the U.S. Treasury. So when you follow the U.S. Treasury rates, I am very much linked to the U.S. Treasury rates, okay? Um, with FMO, that's the Dutch Treasury. Um, it's also a quasi, it's a public-private partnership, 51% state, 49% private. Um, but it's the Dutch, and the Dutch have been probably one of the greatest merchant bankers of, of the world. They, they financed the discovery of America, right? That was in the 15th century, right? Um, but again, to bring that money from these countries to here, that's very difficult, very difficult, and it requires an important fiduciary responsibility that we have. <coughs> Okay, so here's the team, fancy picture, a lot of people, private equity in the end, when you go and talk to people about raising money, all they care about is the who, right? You could even go, if, you're, if you really like the who, people would just give you money just based on the who without the idea, if they really like who the who are, right? So here's our people. One thing that's really neat about our team, which is very unusual in our space, is 50% of our partnership are women, okay? That's super unusual. Think about the caucuses, right? Think about all the banks and how many women leaders you have in any, any of the financial institutions here. Probably none. One. One. Ages, that's recently. Okay. Beautiful. There you go. Very unusual, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see we've got a nice balance of, of women and men. Um, and in the finance industry, when I went to work, we were 70% men, 30% women. If you go to Wall Street, it's probably 90 10. You know? And even though we talk a big game, it's still 90 10. Um, okay. So, I'm going to just get into um, a little bit about, um, so 
sort of what we do and talk a little bit about what makes us different from banks. I'd like to show this little graph. We've been using this for a long time because we are a little bit different than private equity, right? So if you look at a curve of the risk and reward of financing, we are in the middle, okay? We are what you call a mezzanine financing institution, all right? Private equity and venture capital, they are taking higher risk and they demand higher return. Banks take less risk and demand less return. Banks are asset-backed lenders, and they have to be because going back to other people's money, their other people's money is grandmother's money. They have depositors. They're hyper-regulated. It's a different when you start managing unsophisticated people's money. You have to watch those much more closely because if you lose grandmother's money, you have a run on a bank, you have a revolution. That's how bad things happen in countries when banks screw up, right? We, on the other hand, in private equity, if we lose money, we're losing smart people's money. And that's the fundamental difference, right? They know what they're doing. They made a conscious decision to take that risk. And it's a fundamental difference when you're managing other people's money. Are you managing sophisticated money or unsophisticated money? And you need to think about that from a fiduciary responsibility. Okay, so what we do, and it's a really different, different approach. The first thing we do that's very different than traditional private equity is we invest in SMEs, okay? The only traditional private equity and venture capital that invests in SMEs, which means technically it's less than 15 million in revenues, but it's really about employment. You know, less than 250 people tends to be the number, 15 million in assets. That tends to be venture capital, when they're really taking a risk on this high growth, cool idea, right? But the real sector, private equity and venture capital, private equity doesn't really like investing in unsophisticated. We invest in companies that the average revenue in Georgia is 800,000 and the average revenue in Armenia is about 400 to 500,000, right? So our average ticket size tends to be about four to 500,000 in Armenia and about 800,000 in Georgia, right? That is a very small amount of money and we immediately have a problem when we do small amounts of money. And this is what private equity doesn't like doing. We have transaction costs, right? So a real private equity shop would look at Armenia and they'd say, we're not going to go to Armenia. We don't understand the regulations. Then what we'll do, we'll create a, a, a company offshore, what we call an SPV, a special purpose vehicle. We'll put money there. They will under own 100% of what's going on in Armenia. So it'll be a subsidiary of this Dutch entity, okay? That takes $150,000 of legal costs, right? We're out of the game. You can't do an $800,000 deal with $150,000 of legal costs. So what we do is we come local. We set up our operations here locally, and we then standardize the way we invest. And then we do super, 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 super aggressive structuring. We want to know what our yield is going to be. We want to know what the outcome is going to be. We're focused on the exit. But to do that, we have to understand the cash flows. So we do our discounted cash flow analysis. We identify what that company can generate under a best case, base case, worst case scenario. We then calculate the debt service coverage ratio to see if they can cover it. We then either give them a debt instrument or an equity instrument, okay? Now here's the nuance. If we do the debt instrument, we then latch on something called a royalty. Anybody know what a royalty is? Royalty, 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 yes. I, it's uh, somehow we can call income participation. You are participating in, in the income that's generated by the company, exactly. It's a quasi-equity instrument. You are taking a percentage and you're taking risk that the CAGR, remember the person was talking about revenues and growing 20%? If we believe that company's gonna grow at 20%, we can give them a principal payment, an interest payment, and then we layer on a percentage of the revenues. We effectively own one, five, 10% of the revenues based on our calculations that it's gonna grow. And if it grows, suddenly we're not just earning a bank, a prime lending rate, we're actually generating an equity-like rate, because we picked a company that's growing fast and generating lots of cash. Now the problem is, sometimes it puts a burden on its EBITDA. Anybody know what earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, EBITDA, 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 EBITDA. We talk a lot about EBITDA, because we're working with a lot of companies that eh, net income doesn't always generate the levels that we like, but the EBITDA margin is critical for us. Right? We look at the EBITDA margin like eagles. Can they produce enough cash to pay us back? And if that debt and the royalty is too heavy, then we start looking at equity. 
and then we start pushing back the payments later, right? And we tend to use something called a put. A put is, think about it, putting the shares back to the owners, back to the company. They pet buy us back for those shares at a pre-agreed price. If it's more, because we always do the higher of actual versus the reality. Let's say it's the higher of, of the EBITDA margin or a floor price that we set, okay? If they don't hit their EBITDA margin, let's say it's 8x, and we'll talk about 8, 10, 12, how we come up, that goes back to the comps analysis. That analysis would tell us, okay, that is where our upside is. If they outperform the 8x multiple that Mika has decided, great, we get a share in that upside. But if they don't, we've set a floor price, we've locked it in, and we progressively exit our position through three, three, four, two payments in the later years. That gives the company what we call the hockey stick. It gives them a chance to grow, generate more cash, right? Sometimes a company, when they're going from A to B, can do an, uh, an exponential jump in growth if they're given that opportunity. So you have to wait for that opportunity to occur. You can't just look at what they have as assets and collateral. You have to look at what they actually can do in terms of generating cash. All right. So this is a snapshot of what we've done. It's probably too hard to see. I have no idea where Georgia are. These used to be map. These used to be countries. There's there they are down there. And so countries have just disappeared. But a couple things about us. We have a blend of instruments, which is unusual in private equity. Right? Typically, um, private equity funds and venture capital are mono. They do debt. They do equity. They do sector. We are sector agnostic. Look at how diversified we are. In fact, even Armenia versus Georgia are very different. We've got more exporting companies, more light industry. In Georgia, we've got more retail and services. But we do everything. We do hospitals, hotels, schools, food chains, laundromats, um, God, what? what? Wineries, uh, boutique hotels. Um, we, we've done you know, 23 investments in anything you can imagine in the real sector. We haven't done an IT Though I think one of the deals in, Ar in, in Armenia does have an IT feature to it. Um, so we're diversified. You can see here are our four exits. We exited from two wine uh, boutique hotels, a laundry, and a hospital. And you can see 49%. Our lowest IRR was at 18%. A blended 26%. Okay? That's really darn good, to be honest with you, in this region. Getting out of your position is critical. Yeah. And who acquired those? So, um, in uh, the uh, Dr. Rogers was a refinancing, Chateau Mary was a refinancing, Royal Batoni was an acquisition by a Russian oligarch, and um, the hotel was also a refinancing. So, three refinancing and one acquisition. And then we are exiting another bakery right now, and that is also an acquisition by another private equity fund, actually. Um, it's a copycat. They copied us and came in two years after us. Um, so we'll have two, actually, acquisitions soon. But refinancing is great. We're fine with refinancing. And the thing about we, what we do with refinancing is unique. We have taken an equity risk when we make an investment. Our collateral might be 25%, might be 50%, you know, but it's not 100 150%, right? So we take this risk. We give them lots of capital, right? So they come to us and say, oh, we're great now. I mean, with, with uh, Dr. Rogers, which is the leading laundry company now in Georgia. So you can imagine tourism's growing, right? And we like to invest in what we call picks and shovels businesses. That's a, it's a, it's a classic sort of American business school term. We don't invest in the mines, the gold mine, the copper mine, that's not our business. That's club type investing, that's the big boys, we stay away from that. We like to invest in, in the supply chain. The guys that make the picks, the guys that make the shovels. So anybody heard of Levi's? Right? We use Levi's as an example. They were the first to make jeans, and they sold jeans to miners who were going to Alaska and California to dig gold, right? The guys that invested in Levi's made a lot of money, right? The guys that went and dug gold, eh, about 1% of them made a lot of money. 99% didn't make much, right? So we invest in the picks and shovels. Dr. Rogers is a laundry company, right? And their problem was this. They had this nice little laundry. They were serving small, small hotels. I think their biggest client was a company called Ibis. We have Marriott with three, right? Three major. So you've got one big Marriott, you've got a courtyard coming on. So they've got a Marriott, uh, a courtyard, uh, but there's three basic, basically properties that, that one, one company owns. Their demand for laundry is two tons per day, okay? Chateau, I mean, Dr. Roger, 
total volume production was two tons per day, which means you can't serve this industry. No bank was willing to take them to 10 tons. We were, right? Because if they wanted to play in the game, they had to also serve Radisson, Marriott, the Jara Group, right? And to play in that game, you had to scale instantly. And so we took them to 10 tons, they got the Marriott contract, they got the Radisson contract, and they didn't need us anymore, right? Fine, they prepay us, but what we get is not only the prepayment, we get all of the royalties that they were due for five years, okay? We get that condensed in one payment. And that bullet payment results in a really nice equity-like return. So it was a refinancing, but we still got an equity-like return. And we had a debt instrument securing our position, which is pretty strong, okay? So let's talk about an actual example. Does anybody, has anybody ever heard of this company, garage.am? Yes, I've heard of it. Hey, we got one person. Oh. You know a little bit about us, so you're cheating. <laughs> <laughs> anybody? You've heard of them? Yes. Ah, that's great. <laughs> we love investing in companies that aren't necessarily brand names, right? Because if you look at the real sector, all the stuff that goes on behind making this country and city work, right? They're not necessarily very sexy. These guys are an online distributor of automotive spare parts. And they also have a chain of repair shops. Mm -hmm. But interesting, if you looked at their revenues, 10% of their revenues comes from fixing cars, fixing Muscoviches and Hyundais. That's not where they make their money. They make their money online from B2B sales of spare parts. Some B2C too. All right? You've got four entrepreneurs, men in Army and University, both. University. university. I think some of them served all <coughs> the time. Right. Um, and that's actually interesting. In, 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 in Georgia, we have mostly partnerships. In Armenia, we have mostly owners. And I should probably talk about the differences between Georgia and Armenia, because there are actually some striking differences. Um, but, and another thing is that we never have Georgians coming into Armenia, but we have lots of Armenians going into Georgia, mm -hmm. right? So these guys, because <laughs> it's an arbitrage, interesting arbitrage opportunity, because of their lack of trading relationship with their northern neighbor, the spare parts come all the way to Armenia and go back to Georgia. And, be, and they're exported from Armenia, right? So it's a great arbitrage play. But and Georgians, so I'm sorry, have also started to... They're coming in. Yes. They're coming in. Yes, yes. Which isn't, isn't, isn't very typical, because there's not a lot One of... One of the biggest companies uh, in the automotive industry have entered the Armenian market. To Which is together, right? Yes. Yeah. And they're a great company. Their actually. revenue is more than $200 million. And they also have a currency account. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's good. But are they are they Akosike type, Akoklaki, or are they actually? No, 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 Georgians. Real Georgians. Georgians. Okay. They, they opened on Mashtov Avenue a new show. That's great. It's great to hear. We are we aren't seeing Georgian SMEs. So that's a big. You're talking about big players. We have not seen SMEs coming south, but we see lots of SMEs going north, which is great. We want to see that synergies. So that gives more scale. Going back to my original point, remember about liquidity. More economic activity, we go from a 3.7 million uh, population market to 7, 8 million population market, right? So it matters how many people are in the market. So we love that cross-border type uh, uh, business. And so these guys, what we liked about them is they knew their growth was on the online sales, but they had a problem. When you think about spare parts, and again, you probably don't think about spare parts, but when you get into our business, you think about things like this. Spare parts, actually, there's hundreds of makers of a single Hyundai windshield wiper. Hundreds of different makers. It's not by Hyundai. When you buy a windshield wiper, it's not from Hyundai. I mean, they, they may outsource it and put a Hyundai stamp on it, but it's probably from some Taiwanese, Chinese, Malaysian company, right? So when you go online, or you work with these guys, and you try to figure out what windshield wiper to buy, the SKUs are a disaster. SKU is sort of an indicator of their sort of identification, right? It's the way the computer sorts. So what these guys have figured out is a sorting system so that you can go online and just say, I need a windshield wiper for this model, and the 100 SKUs get sorted, and then like an Ebolian search, right? And it comes back with a recommendation and price list, okay? Pretty simple, right? It's an application of IT technology and know-how that you have in Armenia, and these guys have figured it out. And the big thing they've done since they, took, they joined with us is they were used to working for, with MX and MX which is the Russian distributor, now with our money they're able to go direct, directly to the actual suppliers, okay? And that's what happens when you start working with SMEs and giving them real money and growth money, is suddenly they have scale 
And scale is buying power. Buying power means more scale efficiency. Okay? Great thing about these guys, remember I said the hockey stick? This is great venture capital terms. Look at that curve. Growth, growth. 0.5 million now, uh, when we started, 1.6, all right? 3x revenue growth, all right? And on top of that, remember the value add? We did come in, we helped them design the new uh, handheld to the, what do you call it, mobile platform for their new uh, technology, right? And so what we do, and this is what differentiates us from traditional private equity. Traditional private equity is like $500 million, they do 10 investments. If they need to put a CFO, remember that example when I showed you John Doerr where they said, well, you know, I might fire you, I might put a new marketing guy. They've got a lot of cash flow and a lot of money they're managing and a lot of fees that they can use to solve problems. We're doing a lot more deals than private equity. We do five to seven X more deals. So in our total portfolio, when we're done, we'll have done 70 deals, okay? A traditional private equity fund would need 10 or 12, right? Five, seven times more deals. Less than banks, but a lot more than private equity. So what we've done is we've built a sidecar technical assistance facility where we do very, very targeted interventions to help the company grow, okay? And Ritzana and her team, um, they make decisions working with the Mikhail's team to determine when it's investment capital, when there's additionality, and we'll talk a little bit about impact investment and that sort of, sort of subjective decision criteria that we make. But that's how we work with these guys. Capital, high growth capital, you get the hockey stick curve, what we like to see. We are making a percentage of the revenues. We love to see this revenue growth curve, okay? Now, they're always going to be challenged with their EBITDA and their net profit margins, but eventually, as they pay us out, they're getting more sophisticated, better, they're getting a CFO, they're getting a chief accountant, and suddenly they're able to work with banks, and they get more collateral, right? And then either somebody acquires them, they buy us out, or the bank refinances them. Okay. Is anybody interested in the, this concept of impact investing? Is that conceptually interesting? I was like debating whether to put this slide. Yeah, you'd like to learn about? All right. So a new thing that's going on in the global capital markets is the idea that when you make an investment, you're not just making financial returns, you're actually getting socioeconomic returns from your invest, investment. So the key thing when you say you're doing impact investing is to measure, monitoring evaluation, measure what you've done. So our investors, they've come to Armenia, right, and they want to see that we not only make money for them, but they also want to see that we have a socioeconomic benefit to this, this country, right? And so we track a lot of things very carefully. Jobs, for one. Remember I said gazelles are companies that grow 20% per annum, and 5 to 10% of a given economy consists of these companies, but they're creating 50 to 80% of the jobs. So when we're said, all said and done, and we do these 70 investments, we expect to have three to 4,000 new jobs. And a lot of them are gonna to go to women, right? Right now, we're at 81% of jobs created have gone to women. Um, how many are uh, 233 out of five? So we're almost 40, 50% are going to youth. Um, we even have a portfolio that has women, either women owners or women leaders. It's very rare in this region to get women owners and women leaders into your portfolio. So we've got two women partners, which is a really impactful. People are really excited about that, that we have two women female partners. And on top of that, we've got portfolio companies. I mean, one of our companies, Renatus, is 50% owned uh, by a woman. It's a pharmaceutical company. Would people know the brand is probably through, they, they, they've got the, the natural. Craig's name is in apotheca business. Yeah. Anyways. Um, right now they are in uh, printing business, actually printing packaging for medical stuff. So, and then the other big thing that people expect, particularly when you come to a country like Armenia and Georgia, is actually if you go to Yerevan, you go to Tbilisi, I would rather invest in Yerevan and Tbilisi than some of the rural states in America, right? There's a lot of dynamicism going on just in the city. I mean, just going to the Dumo Center and going up to the second, third, and fourth floor, you're going to find some smart people doing amazing global things, right? Um, so the, the challenge is, the trick is, if you're going to do real impact, is getting out of Yerevan, getting out of Tbilisi. We were just talking, what the GDP you think was 7.5%? Well, yeah. So if there's 7.5%, I can assure you that that means 10% in Yerevan, 12%, maybe even 15% in Yerevan, construction, tourism, what have you, and it's 2% in Gyumri, right? So a country's GDP growth happens largely in the capital. So all the stuff when you talk about China, well, it's happening in three, three cities, Shanghai, Beijing, and Guangzhou. The other ones, 
Not near as much, right? So the capital cities are the key. Getting out of the capital is really important for impact. So we track it very carefully, report it every quarter, and then in the end, we'll be judged on our performance, not only by financial returns, the most important. If you don't make money, you'll never manage money, right? But also we want to show that we actually helped the country and did good things for the country. That's it. So, does anybody have any questions? We can open it up. Yes. When, when you said you are helping the client to, is it, you, you help them with operations? You are getting into operations and helping them find partners and clients? Yeah, so going, going back to this, in this example, you're in private equity and venture capital, right? Me, Nika, Zucker might actually go and negotiate a contract working with the CEO, for example, right? So in Georgia, for example, I was very involved in a recent tender, right? I wanted to make sure that my company, it's a construction company, got a fair shot at winning a tender for the building of, of the Poti Port, okay? So I was very involved strategically in that, right? Now, at certain operational levels, no. We've got too many deals to be suddenly working as the chief operating officer at the CFO. What we have done to emulate what a 10 to 12 company portfolio would look like versus a 50 to 70, with our technical assistance facility, we developed, developed a product called the Floating CFO. And what the Floating CFO does, and this is sort of an interesting thing with SMEs, 60 to 70% of problems with SMEs and their growth happens because of financial management controls. That is the primary barrier of differentiating an SME that's going to become a gazelle and become a corporate or not. So if you know that all of your portfolio suffer from this problem, you don't do one-off solutions on the financing side, on the financial management control. So we have one person or one company that basically floats around and shows up and does interventions as needed. Okay? It could be implementing an accounting system. It could be helping them to do a financial report for the banks, right? So when we're doing our exits, we might step in with the floating CFO and say, listen, we need to get the P&L right, we need to get the balance sheet right, right? No way the bank's gonna give us any money if we don't have proper financial statements. How many SMEs making $800,000 in revenues have a real CFO? Actually, very few, right? They're working with a bugalter, right? So our floating CFO can go do, do targeted interventions. And then when we have a real specific problem, like the garage guys, where are the garage guys? They have this SKU problem, right? They can't figure out how their online system can fix the sorting and the selection of an SKU, hundreds of them. So we involve an IT firm and pay for that with our technical assistance, okay? It was a very targeted, targeted intervention. Now, with Cargill and their private equity shop and, and, and uh, Kleiner Perkins, they might just actually hire a marketing guy, put him in the company. Maybe they'll use their own money to do it, maybe they'll charge the company for it. Depends on, on, on the deal. We can't do that level of intervention. And that's why we're in between private equity and bank lending, and that's why we use this technical assistance facility to do very targeted uh, interventions. Now, that being said, our IOs are constantly on the phone with our, with our companies saying, listen, you've got to improve your reports. This is what we do, you know, and we're constantly engaging them. And banks are much more passive. They're like, just make sure you pay on time, right? We have so much reporting requirements that we're constantly, just by making them go through that process, improving the way they think and operate. Does that answer your question? No. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I just uh, one, just one, one another question. question. How do you share responsibility in that case? Between the? <laughs> Between the investee and the fund. I mean, if you are providing technical assistance, uh, and then it, you know it's it's an interesting point. So this technical assistance money is somewhat soft. Okay, it is um, seventy five percent of it is, is zero interest loans. Is that it, or sixty percent, seventy five percent? I can't remember who's on it. It's the majority, for sure. Yeah, majority. Yeah. Approximately 75. Nobody's going to take a technical assistance engagement seriously if they don't have a responsibility to pay you back, right? And so we make most of our engagements are zero interest loans. When we see a really specific and unique problem, for, particularly for our equity deals where we have to have real growth quickly and we've got a long-term problem, we'll use a grant once in a while. They're small. 
And then the floating CFO, you know, that is somewhat of a subsidy that is used through the technical assistance facility and given to our investees. But it's very selfish of us, right? Because we benefit for better financial reporting and financial management and financial controls, right? Now, the question is whether we should be doing it with Mika by himself. He would never be able to manage the portfolio at that level and get the returns we need. So we do get a little bit of a benefit and a bump, if you want to think about it, that support from the facility. Yeah? Where would you like to be in the next five years in terms of your portfolio and growth? Yeah. So remember I talked about other people's money, right? We're not a bank. We are what we call a closed-end fund, okay? So Gazelle One, what we're doing right now, has a fixed life, okay? And so, but our job is to manage money, right? So based on our track record, based on what we've achieved, we're going to go back to the market and have Gazelle Two. Our hypothesis, our thesis, is a really good question, Anahi, is that the Caucasus is a more dynamic, more democratic, um, more Western forward-thinking sub-region of the Eurasian, what I, I, like to, I call the Eurasia region, but the belt of countries from Eastern Europe to Mongolia. These countries it, it have, I know you feel a lot of problems here, you've got challenges with Azerbaijan and Russia and all that, but in the end you have a lot of some of the Western principles that, what? I'm sorry. Um, that, that really, you know, uh, works for us. So we want to base ourselves in this region and expand from the region, okay? So we grow Gazelle 2, increase our portfolio with another fund, but also we share this know-how with Ukraine. We share this know-how maybe with Uzbekistan, right? And we prove that the leaders were in the Caucasus. And it's not actually untrue, right? Because you know, you've got the best IT sector, maybe the only other place would be Lvov that could compete with an IT sector in the former Soviet Union, right? And Georgia, uh, in terms of its business rankings and ease of doing business and its low regulatory footprint, is definitely one of the easier places for a, a capital markets management company like us to work, right? And that's actually a big difference between Armenia and Georgia, too. All right, this is a highly regulated market. Georgia is a highly unregulated market. So for companies like us, it's easier for us to operate in Georgia doesn't necessarily mean it's a better investment environment, which is ironic, right? Because if you look at the growth over the last 20, 30 years, comparable growth, comparable GDP, comparable GDP per capita, it's just it's just different different approaches to economic growth, right? And we like, particularly in the last year, dramatic, I and mean, I should probably say, dramatic improvement, you know, with SMEs. I call it entrepreneurial confidence, right? Two years ago when we were operating there was always this fear of being the tallest tree in the forest problem, right? There was, I don't know, just to be honest, there was oligarchs controlling complete verticals, right? And suddenly we see oligarchs get wiped out, we see SMEs coming in and feeling confident to grow, right? That's a game changer for us because we need confident and ambitious, remember I said we need supply and demand? We need demand for our capital. We need somebody to say, I am going to be the next corporate. Player. There's not just that 200 or that 50 or that 80. I'm going to be the 201st company. If we don't have that ambition, don't, we don't want to talk to you. Everybody that comes to us has to have that ambition. Otherwise, we're too expensive. Go, go play the games of, you know, gradually with the banks, get some friends to help you and do what you want. You know. But if you have ambition, right? So we want to keep doing that here and we want to ex spread to the region. We want to spread the religion of what we're doing in the region. We want to be able to say, it worked in Armenia. And a lot of people say, oh, Armenia is so difficult. I don't know, we're doing fine in Armenia. So you will bring Ulan Bator business to Yerevan? No, but I think we might bring Armenian Georgian business to, to, to Ulan Bator, right? We're not ready to do that until we operate there. What we've already seen is that if we work with a company here in Georgia and Armenia, we can take an Armenian, at least we've proven we can take an Armenian company to Georgia. We haven't proven yet we can take a Georgian company to Armenia. But if that's already happening, and if, if you do look at the region, because this is another sort of, and I, and I sort of a philosophy of mine, is that I believe because of the former Soviet Union, because of the Russophone connection, there is a loose connection, and you, people are moving 
Like, we see lots of activity with Georgians working in, in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, right? If you go to Georgia, you're going to see Kaztrans gas, you're going to see a lot of Georgians now going to Uzbekistan, right? And, I mean, Armenians are everywhere in the former Soviet Union, right? So you have an amazing diaspora. So it's a natural, most of our companies that we're working with here that are in the export are doing lots of export to Russia. So there's natural synergies between the republics. Yeah, but we need more businesses in Armenia. Don't take our businesses to Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> it's not taking, it's growing. Don't ever confuse the two. We would never take a company out of Armenia and go to, we want to take the know-how. I mean, you know, it's interesting to see together come here is actually a really big deal. But for our little company, Garage.am, to go to Georgia is a big deal. Three Ar out of seven companies, Armenian companies, have their presence in the Georgian market. Mm -hmm. They sell products, they have production here, but they sell there, so on. We, we took a company. But we haven't chosen that. They are specifically doing business in Georgia. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There were other questions. Yeah, yeah. other questions, yes. Yeah. Uh, you said Gazelle One has a fixed time frame. Yes. And do you consider, do you target um, organic growth for Gazelle Two, or is, is there going to be an exit? Like finding other partners for yeah, I mean, this is, to Going back to other expansion. people's money, we're in, we're, ideally, in a, in a perfect world, in an absolute perfect world, I'd love to become a permanent, what we call an evergreen vehicle, right? In a perfect world. But attracting that kind of equity for this region with institutional investors is very difficult, right? So the, the, the proven model, the way our investors work, again, remember, I, I have to work within the context of supply and demand. They like to invest in limited term vehicles. They're more comfortable doing it, because that has their exit, right? Once I go to a permanent vehicle, I have to prove to them that I can go list or sell the company, or that there's a secondary market for their shares, right? That's a big proof point. It's tough to do for a small company like ours. And so most likely, not 100%, I'd say 75%, but I do have one investor that's pushing us towards a permanent vehicle. Um, most likely Gazelle 2 will be a separate fund doing very similar things that we're doing now, right, with a different group of investors. Some overlap, but an expanded group of investors. Now that we're proven, we're going to have more investors and more interest in what we're doing, right? But unfortunately, there's a high probability we'll be forced into a, a, a closed-end fund. Yeah. What's the size of Gazelle 1? Gazelle 1, we have $31 million on, on, under management. But we also have another $10 million of debt that we could access if we needed it. So we have technically $42 million. And what percent has been deployed? Um, we are at 60%. And uh, we'll be at, the big number for us is 75. That's when our investors let us do the next thing. So we're moving towards that rapidly. And how's, how's that um, distributed between Armenia and Georgia? Yeah, good question. So when we, we went to the market with the fund, um, the investors were very strict on exposure, and they wanted greater exposure to Georgia, but they also had a minimum exposure requirement because we went to the market as a diversified fund. So uh, our minimum uh, exposure that we can have um, in Georgia is 60%, and our maximum exposure in Georgia is 75%. So in Armenia, we'll be somewhere between 25 to 40 percent. Now, you're probably trying to do the math on 31 to 42. Something that we can do that no other private equity fund most can't do is that we have delegated rights to recycle our money. So every dollar that comes in, we put right back out. Usually when you have four exits, you would take all that money and send it home, right? Send it back to the investors. We are given six years during our investment period to recycle the money which is great because it means we have a $31 million fund that we're getting paid. We've got this other debt facility we may or may not use. That roughly works to $20, $22 million we actually invest. But because of the multiplier effect of the money moving, the velocity of the money moving, we actually invest $50 million. So if we get to 40%, we could invest up to about $20 million in Armenia and 30 in Georgia. Right? And the last question is what industries are you targeting in Armenia? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, when, when I always say we're sector agnostic, and it's really important in our space. You have 15,000 companies, give or take. You've got maybe 1,000 that fit our eligibility requirements. We never 
limit ourselves by sector. We cannot be sector specialists with unsophisticated small companies because there just isn't enough of it. Maybe IT and venture capital, but I've yet to see somebody raise a dedicated, commercially viable venture capital fund. I hope it happens soon. Um, so, but that doesn't mean we don't look at industries and have you know, a focus. Um, so one thing we really like is uh, the tourism and hospitality industry. And we actually are pretty vocal about that. And we've been very vocal in, in our meeting. We've invested in Apaga, Yell, Yell Extreme Park. Um, but not in the, the extreme part, we invest in the hotel side of the business, for example. We've invested in... You should invest in the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's not our business. Um, we, uh, we invested in three uh, wine chateaus in the Jaqueti region. Um, and we're looking for another one here, because we think that's got a great opportunity. We love, we love the experiential tourism. You know, one of the things, that, the mistakes that I think the initial um, hotel development businesses had here, which is typical, is that they, the idea that people just want to come and stay. People do not want to come and just stay in Armenia, right? They want to come and see something spectacular, right? That's why Yale's doing so darn well, right? People want to go and see something special. Right? So when people come to Georgia, yeah, they want to see Tbilisi and walk around, but they can't wait to get to Kakheti. And nobody saw that coming. They actually want to see the grapes. They, like, they actually want to step on the grapes. Right? So we're really interested in that. <coughs> and we're interested in the supply chain. That's why we invest in a laundry company. And I was right. When I told my guys when we started, I said, get me a laundry company. 20% growth per annum in tourism. We're going to get some boutique hotels, but you know, that's going to be hard for us. Hotels are expensive. Go to the guys that supply the hotels, you know. And then we've looked, we, look, we like the food and beverage uh, industry. Um, we love exports. It's the hardest thing for us to do. We got more in Armenia than we do in Georgia. We've actually, we just finally got a good export uh, company, a hazelnut producer in western Georgia. It's the leading Georgian. There's some big players, that, you know, Nutella, right? No Nutella, right? So the guys, Ferrero, right? They, they dominate the market. So we invested in the big Georgian player and they export, right? Why do we like, our biggest risk just by the way, and it's, it's true for anybody in this, in this space, you know, it is impossible to get a real hedge instrument for currency. Right? So we can't take dollars and then do draw. Can't do it. So we take the dollars and we put the dollar risk onto our entrepreneurs. But that, it's, just, it's sort of disingenuous, right? Because the entrepreneurs are getting drawn revenues, right? So we have to really understand the depreciation risk when we're doing investment. And one of the ways we can hedge is to get dollar denominated revenues. And that goes back to tourism and hospitality. Our hotels, 75%, I mean, we've actually been surprised how much domestic tourism there is. Um, if you're within two hours of Tbilisi, massive domestic tourism all year round. Um, but, you know, 60, 70% of that's dollar denominated. So we love dollar denominated revenue. So export, big thing. We thought we'd have more agribusiness, to be honest. And we were wrong, right? You don't know that till you get to the market. It's tough to do agribusiness well. We've done really niche agribusiness work, right? Really, we do specialty beef in in, um, in Georgia. We've got this hazelnut play. Uh, anything in Armenian agribusiness? Not yet. Well, we're looking at some dried fruits, yeah. But that's, you know, agribusiness is tough. Um, in IT, we haven't learned how to do well yet. Um, largely because the people that are that we're looking at, we haven't really looked at the supply chain. I think there's somewhere we can be in the IT space that's more about services as opposed to the next great idea, right? Because we don't do the next great idea very well. That's not our business, that's venturing up. We can't have that failure rate. Um, we have, we're going to allow for a higher failure rate because we take higher risk, of course, than a bank, but we can't have venture capital failure rate. Yeah? Complimenting on your uh, thoughts on farmers and other business. Yes. So we have a lot of family businesses, yep. uh, farmers, individual enterprises in Armenia. Yep. We have big players in our business, for instance, and very, very small family-based businesses. That's yep. the, um, one of the points uh, operating in Armenia, I guess. Yes. Yeah, no, and, and, and a lot of individual enterprises which, are, uh, which cannot uh, have cash flows in dollars. But here's where the difference is. I encourage you next time you go to SAS, because I, we do have a couple interesting deals that are coming up. Go to SAS, right? And look at the products. And I often encourage my guys, how do you find deals? I mean, that's the, actually, you know, it's interesting. Whenever I, whenever I talk to investors, like, how do you find deals? 
think it's a country of 3.7 million people. I can drive, you know, he can be everywhere in one day. You can do the whole country in one day. Oh, you don't tell me it's hard to find people, right? I mean, it, it's not that hard, right? I'll show you India, right? You know, then, then we'll say how, how hard it's hard to find deals, right? But here it shouldn't be that hard because it's a small country, right? But be creative, you know, and, and so agribusiness, what we're interested in is in when somebody creates a brand. Right? Suddenly, we see the, the, the value chain and, and the connection. So we did, and I, we, I'll, I'll use an example, and it's the one we're exiting right now. It's one of my favorite deals we've done so far because it's got a great story. And you, and in my business, you have to be able to tell a story. If you can't tell a story, nobody's going to give you money, right? And so we have invested in a company who came to us and said, Jeff, Stalin wiped out the grain industry in Georgia in favor of semi-sweet wine. Ukraine got grain, we got semi-sweet wine. Kings Maruli, Konspara, whatever Stalin liked, that's what we produced, okay? But we actually have been growing grain, like Armenia, for centuries, thousands of years. In fact, grain comes from here. If you look at where grain comes from, it starts you know, from the Caucasus down to you know, the Tigris and the Euphrates, right? That's where grain comes from. All the world's grain started here, right? And this guy, blew out the whole industry. Georgia in 1915 was a net exporter of grain, right? So these guys said, Jeff, we want to make bread from Georgian grain. So we're going to take grain seeds from a seed bank that's been supported by some development NGO type guys. We want to get them into the farmer's hands, right? And we want them to start growing grain. Okay, well, that's a great idea, right? And look, we've, we've already done this. We've got 50 farmers that are growing this grain. And look at this bread we made in our little bakery. It's good bread. But what I really liked was these guys were not bakers. They weren't farmers. You know what these guys were? They were retail marketing, FMCG guys. They know how to get bread into sauce, the equivalent of sauce in, in Georgia. That's the most important thing, is to create the brand. That's where we're going to see value creation. These guys got our money. We gave them $400,000. They had $10,000 revenues per month when we, when we came in. In six months, they went from $10,000 to $60,000 and were the number three seller of and, and bread. You know, you don't think of puri. What's the uh, lavash? This is cut bread. This is the bread that you know ends up with sandwiches and sort of the modern day butterbrot sandwich kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And they're the number three player, and that happened in six months, right? And what happened was, and it's, it's fascinating, I mean, my whole staff's like, oh, we love this bread. I tell people about it, we love this bread. And why do they love this bread? Because it's made in Georgia. It's 100% the yeast, the bread, the water, I think salt. And there's like four ingredients, maybe four or five ingredients. They even make it from like an old ancient species of yeast, right? And it's branded and made in Georgia. This sauce. <coughs> Look at some of these products. We're looking at them very carefully. You're going to see us come on the market with some of these companies. The guys that have the guts to make a brand, because there's loyalty in these countries. There's real loyalty. They want to drink Armenian wine, right? Look at how fast the wine sector's growing. And it won't just be export driven, it'll be domestically driven too, right? We were talking, what it was, uh, 10 million uh, exports from Armenia, 250 from Georgia? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, 9.8 million uh, in sales in sales of wine from Armenia, and 250 million from Georgia. I thought it was 90 million from Georgia. Sure. Billion? Million. Um, 90 million. No, I'm, I'm sure it's much higher. 250 million. Yeah. But anyways, that's the industry. You know, it's just like, is it 7.5% GDP growth? The World Bank says it's 5 I don't know, right? But the point is that wine growth is happening very aggressively. In fact, the Russian embargo helped the Georgian wine industry, right? Um, but that, those branded type products, that's how we get to agribusiness, because we're never going to be able to invest in, in the basic farm. We're the wrong company to do that, frankly, right? But we are, and, and what we've had an impact in Georgia, everybody wants the seeds now to grow this grain. Right? And you know these guys are really clever? The way they distribute the seeds, they do it through the Orthodox Church. <laughs> right? So, because you know where the patriarch, they, they've got patriarch, I don't even know what they're called, but they're in every village, right? So you give them a bag of seeds and say, distribute it to your, to your, your parishioners, right? And so suddenly, you know, they, they, they've got, you know, the original, you know, corn, and then there's this, you know, new row of, of Georgian grain, right? And that happened not because we invested in the farmer. We invested 
way, 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 way downstream. And the downstream influenced the upstream. And when it's all said and done, I think that investment will be the investment that triggered the, the return of the grain industry. Right? So there's lots of ways to get at, at industries that sometimes isn't right at the point. Sometimes you have to go away from the point to influence the point. And that's what private equity and venture capital does. You have to have that vision, right, and see the market trend and be ahead of it, right? And if we can't see the future, we shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Sorry. Any other questions? We are very impressed by what Kazan does. Okay. We would like to see growth and growth, second and third and fourth, and more money, more liquidity, more all of that. <laughs> hey, good job. The lesson that I learned. She got the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> and that more of our graduates are hired. Yeah. And then that more jobs are created in Armenia. <laughs> and I'm amazed how much you covered in this one and a half hours. And what a great speaker you are. And the knowledge that you shared and the expertise and really uh, the, the broad picture of the things. So thank you very much. You know, I am one of the first year MBA graduates, but this was refreshing of many, many concepts. And when we were studying none of this, yes, Michael was present in Armenia. <laughs> so that's what we were. So thank you really from b the bottom of our heart. We hope that uh, we will have more of similar uh, discussions. And uh, that's wonderful that you speak Russian, but improve your Armenian. <laughs> <laughs> he speaks Chinese. <laughs> okay, but China has it's virus. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't need to deal with virus. You come to Armenia, it's a homogeneous country, it's a nice country. We can grow very effectively. Can't you make goodbye easier? I said so soon. <laughs> no, it's not easy. It's not. We don't want to say goodbye. We we want to stay calm and spend more time and be among us. We love AUA, we love you, we love Armenia, and we want to see uh, successful business. Well, and, and I want to say also that you know we're always looking for great people. I mean, our, as, if, if you go back, we have no assets, right? This, that's our intellectual property right here, right? And so all we think about, I think about 50% of my time is who. Right, who we are, right? That's right, but next time so we please want have... We want more AUA grads with us. That's right, but next time you can have 50 pictures. <laughs> this is not enough. <laughs> yeah, you need to have much more. Right? Good. And we are very proud of the graduates that work for Gazelle. Yeah, we are very, very happy. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.